Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Specifying Practice Group webinar. Our topic for today is the future of specifications. Our thought leaders are Dave Stutzman and Lewis Metcalf. Dave is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, a specifications and quality assurance consulting firm. Lewis is an architect and certified construction specifier. Lewis is the Senior Quality Manager for Gresham Smith & Partners, a national architecture, engineering, interiors, and planning firm. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your participation during today's webinar is encouraged, and we've allowed the time to take questions throughout the presentation. Although attendee audio lines are muted, you may click the raise hand button at any time to indicate that you have a question or comment. We'll identify you by name and unmute your line, at which point you may begin speaking. If you're participating via streaming audio and do not have a computer microphone, you may also type your question into the chat box. Now, Dave Lewis, over to you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave coming to you from southern New Jersey. And Rob, I don't know, but I think you're trying to give the control to me for the uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. and I think that needs to go to Lewis. Pass over. I'll pass, pass it over there. there. Uh, and Lewis is coming to you from beautiful downtown Memphis. So we're uh, not looking at each other, so just make sure that you understand that we're not able to take visual cues from each other. So today, uh, Lewis, while we were in Chicago, uh, was presenting at the Construct 2011 and part of the panelist uh, for future specifications. Of course, he went there to hobnob with all the other uh, wizards of the uh, practice groups uh, while I was doing a separate presentation. So, so what we're going to get today is Lewis's rendition of uh, what he had uh, presented in Chicago and what we do is we hope that it'll spark some uh, lively debate here. We know that all of you are, we can rely on you for the um, debate and we, we strongly encourage it. So, we don't expect uh, the slides to take an entire hour, and we do expect you to help us fill the hour today. But before we get started, I had a special request from Cheryl Dodd Hansen to ask uh, that we announce that CSI is running a survey, a validation survey of the CCS uh, uh, exam. And that survey is available on uh, the CSI website through SurveyMonkey. It was published in the uh, CSI Weekly. So if you're getting that subscription, you'll find a link in the CSI Weekly uh, to be able to take and take the survey and add your expertise to CSI's database because it's just a way to help uh, improve uh, the certification materials. So with that, Lewis, I'll pass it over to you and you can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you, David. Um, uh, David mentioned that I'm uh, in uh, Memphis, but in fact, uh, I managed to escape from Memphis almost four years ago, and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm here in the center of Music City, Nashville. That's all right. That's all right. And, uh, it's a gorgeous day. It's too good a day to be sitting inside talking about specs, but we'll do it anyway. Also, uh, Dave uh, is, is going to be reporting on some of the conversations that he had at, uh, at the uh, convention with uh, some of the movers and shakers and thinkers. And one of those people, Walt Marlowe, the executive director of CSI, is actually online with us today. And we hope to engage him in some of that conversation, if nothing else, to keep David straight on his uh, re reporting of conversations that he had with him. So the, the presentation that uh, I participated in is the future of specifications. And uh, the James Robertson was the moderator. Mark Kalin is the co-host of the a, a sustainability practice group, and Robert Weigand of the BIM practice group. And uh, of course, I get to do this once a month with my good friend and uh, partner David Stutzman for the specifying practice group. So uh, we talked a little bit about what the practice groups were and their importance and how we're hoping to, to uh, promote their use. And uh, we've been 
David and I have just been thrilled with the amount of response that we get from uh, our folks, and I, I, I hope that we are uh, presenting some practical and usable information and encouragement to our attendees. So uh, we talked about the future specifications with respect to BIM, and uh, Mr. Weigand just recently published a, a book on that subject and uh, I haven't got my hands on yet, but I certainly intend to read. Uh, and then Mark talked about sustainability issues in relationship to, spec to specifications. And then I got to talk a little bit about the future of the specifier as a role. And in fact, both Mark and Bob, uh, we did not get together in advance. So we didn't go over the presentations that we had with each other. But um, uh, our, that, uh, it was interesting that all of us came to uh, the same conclusion. And it relates to this, this slide. What is the future of the specifier? Well, there's a new industry emphasis on information. We uh, new awareness by design teams, architects and engineers have finally started to understand that they are in the information business, not the drawing business. When I started here at, at Gresham four years ago, I was in one studio, and now I'm uh, working in corporate services. But in that studio, we had a lot of young folks, and uh, a couple times a month we would have opportunities for a little get gatherings to uh, talk about uh, various subjects. And one of the things that whenever I got a chance to talk about quality or specifications that I stressed is we are not in the drawing business. We're in the process, the business of creating and managing and disseminating information. And the question then is, whether a given type of information is best created and communicated in BIM, in 2D drawings, in specifications, or in schedules. But what is not so clearly understood is that design teams need a person designated to plan and manage that creation, development, and communication of information. Multidiscipline firms, such as the one that I work for, do not always have someone designated to assemble the various documents into a coherent and complete package. And because most projects now have construction documents issued in multiple work packages rather than a single bidding set, this need is becoming more critical than ever. And so here's the, the new concept. The project specifier is a project design information manager. And as I say, I was pleasantly surprised that both uh, Robert Weigand and Mark Kalin in their presentations made this exact same point. They refer to it as a knowledge manager. I like information because knowledge to me implies more the just the abstract stuff, but information includes not only technical knowledge and background and know-how, but includes project decisions that have been made. So people with specific, yes, David. Oh, I was just going to relay a, a story to try to uh, supplement what you're saying here is that just, what, right just, this, just this week I met with two separate firms in New York City. Uh, we're not working directly with either one of them yet, uh, but prom prominent New York City firms, and they're both still trying to wrestle with what is BIM and what sorts of uh, information is supposed to be included in BIM. And I was amazed that the question coming to me as a specifier was actually, what are you able to do to help us with this whole project? They're actually looking for someone to try to help take the lead in organizing the information that they're presenting. Um, yes, that is, that's the industry trend, and that's something that 
we need to be prepare for and uh, will make us indispensable, which is in this job climate is something that we all need to do. CSI's historic role, so people with specific skills in preparing specifications coordinated with other forms of information are the ones that are best prepared for this new role, as evidenced by Dave's conversations. CSI, of course, has had a historic role in developing tools for organizing and, and communicating information master format, unit format, omniclass, even section format and page format are all dealing with that. So the, uh, the skilled specifier uh, is, is going to be, I think it actually has the opportunity to grow in importance as a role and we hope to encourage uh, a new crop of younger folks making this as a decision a career decision and uh, a new move for them. Well, what is information? We talk about managing information, and creating it, and so forth. What is it? According to research by Fred Stitt, author of several books on construction drawings and an instructor at the San Francisco Institute of Architecture, over half the time spent on a given drawing is actually redrawing. So while some redrawing is unavoidable, the primary source of avoidable redrawing is simply drawing ahead of what is known about the project, including decisions about products. I've been performing quality assurance reviews on a wide variety of project sizes and types for the last 16 years, and it's very common to see whole sheets that will have to have major reworking because the drafters clearly did not have either the technical knowledge or the decisions needed to be able to draw the drawings. Industry trends from BIM, from IPD, that's Integrated Project Delivery, and Lean Concepts all point to the importance of nation and the critical importance of developing information at the right time during the project, making good decisions early and not backtracking. So, Lewis, does this... Well, what is uh, information... Yes? Uh, I'm sorry. It seems like there must be a, an audio delay, and it feels like I'm interrupting you, but <laughs> does this relate to <laughs> architects... Since when did that ever inhibit you? <laughs> Oh, we'll try to keep it to a mild roar. Um, does this relate to architects working initially with BIM models and modeling as generic objects and then eventually moving to more detailed objects? Yes, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, absolutely, that's as we progress in our understanding of, of uh, of a given project, one of the things that we now have the tools for is to develop that that information in a more seamless fashion, so that we can proceed from the generic to the specific, to down to the very technical details, both in terms of graphics and the written information. But uh, first, let's I want to wax a little more philosophical for a while longer and we'll ask where does information come from? We always, I gave you a working definition of, of information in the previous slide. Mere facts or decisions are not information. To be information, to be meaningful, data must have an organizing structure. CSI has always been at the forefront of developing formats for different purposes that support the creation, communication, and retrieval of construction information so that the information is usable and readily available for reasoning and action, which is part of my that working definition of information. And in this case, that's the structure is just those CSI formats. Structure for meaning, structure for information development, structure for information management, and finally structure for information retrieval. As I think that was ultimately the original purpose behind master format 
if you can't find a piece of information, it doesn't exist. You don't have it. Unnecessary RFIs we deal with on a daily basis, and they, they're not good for the contractor either. The contractor will look at the drawings, look at the specs, and, and try to figure out what information, uh, specific information that they're, they're looking for, a subcontractor, <clears throat> and they'll probably give a good faith effort for five or ten minutes, and then they're going to haul off and send an RFI. That's a waste of time for the contractor, and it's certainly a waste of time for the, the uh, designers. We need to have information in a form that, uh, that is readily retrievable and usable. Right, and if we can get it so that it's found quickly, all the better, and that's the beauty of the CSI formats. That's, exactly. That's, that's kind of what I think CSI was founded for back in 1948. I don't remember real well because I was only two years old at the time, but I think the, the basic idea was to try to improve those communications. And over the years, I think we've made significant uh, advances in doing so. In the past, development of information was done in discrete stages with very little carryover between them. When I was an apprentice back in the 1960s, it was a matter of some controversy as to whether it would take less time to modify SD drawings, a lot of eraser dust and elbow grease, for DD phase or to actually start over. But project information traditionally passed from the owner to the design team to the contractor and then back to the owner, and that required <coughs> starting over each time <coughs> with a uh, loss of efficiency and opportunities for meaningful information to be misunderstood or even lost in the transitions. In computer terms, handoffs between participants in this kind of model are sometimes called lossy. But our new goal is this. To Today we at least realize that information development needs to be a process of cumulative growth with various entities making contributions to a single information set. Instead of starting over in construction, construction teams can utilize BIM files produced by the design team to prepare coordination and shop fabrication drawings. Deliverables become snapshots taken at appropriate I don't know about anyone else. I hate doing things more than once. It just, to me, is a waste of time. And if I can build on what's already done, all the better. And that gets back to uh, Mr. Stitt's remark about the redrawing. If we make good decisions at the right time and communicate those decisions to the, uh, the people that need that information, they can proceed with the drawings. They can proceed with the, uh, the written specifications in an orderly fashion and not have to backtrack and not have to redo things, not have and there be fewer changes during the design period. And uh, that's just good for everybody. It, it saves time and it certainly saves money. Lewis, I have the perfect solution for this. I was reading a book. Oh, uh, what's that? It was uh, How to Write Architectural Specifications, How to Write Them. Uh, Goldwyn Goldsmith, written in 1940, and I think <laughs> the answer is he waited until the drawings were done, and then he came out and wrote that. That I think is the answer for us as specifiers. <laughs> that is the old model, uh, uh, and uh, that's you know uh, it, right. When I was a cub draftsman back in the 60s, that's. The specifier was this fun little guy that lived in a small room way back at the end of a hall. And out, somebody would take him in a roll of drawings as thick as a tree trunk, and then 
he was expected to sit down and churn out the specs in that rather short period and uh, and make the specs fit the, the drawings. When I became a full-time specifier in 1982, what had happened was the previous specifier, a longtime CSI member, had uh, actually died. And this is, uh, it, I, I don't mean to mean light of it, but literally he went home one Friday night and did not come back in Monday morning because he'd gone on to that great drafting room in the sky. And uh, so the principal that hired me said, you know, we have, we win lots of design awards, we put out uh, superior uh, drawings, and what we want is somebody to take the specifications program and raise it to the same level of expertise. And he actually gave me a whole month to just sit and think about how to do that. So uh, one of the first things that I did was I started getting involved <clears throat> with the uh, design teams at, as early as possible in schematic design and helping advise them about uh, selection of materials. For example, we were doing a, I remember one project and I was talking with the designers very early and talking about the roofing and I said, what kind of roof were you planning to put on? And uh, he told me that they were thinking about a ballasted EPDM roof and I said no 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 this is a uh, it was the juvenile uh, uh, justice center for Hamilton County Ohio and I said no this this is a long-term project we need to think about something that's a little tougher and longer lasting and and so forth and and so I promoted uh, modified bitumen instead and that actually affected the design of the building uh, so uh, I know Dave's interjection there was more than a little facetious, but uh, we do need to be an integral part of this information flow. And I really believe that we specifiers are in the best position to help manage that information and help identify what decisions need to be made and when they need to be made. I always used to joke that one of the unwritten parts of my job description as a specifier was that I was a decision prod. You know, I'd walk down st stairs and say, you, I need the windows picked this week, tomorrow. <laughs> well, let's talk about this s slide. Where is the best place for information? In the past, it was pretty clear what information went on drawings and what went in the specs. With the advent of BIM, it becomes necessary to make conscious decisions about where the information will go. And these decisions will vary between firms and even between projects within a single firm and will change as hardware and software for BIM progresses. In the old days, <clears throat> if you were doing a, a project of a given size and complexity, let's say a, a neighborhood branch bank, the drawings and specs from one firm as opposed to another firm would look about the same. It would be the same, approximately the same level of detail and the same kinds of information would be on the drawing as opposed to the information in the specs. But today we have owners who go to BOMA meetings and they hear all these wonderful things about BIM and all this kind of stuff. And, and as a, one of our uh, IT guys says, these clients come back to us saying, uh, give me some of that BIM stuff. And they may have unrealistic expectations about what we're prepared to do. So we, we uh, have invented this new thing now that we have to consciously decide what, how much information is going to go in the BIM model. And that is limited to a certain extent by the hardware that we have available right now and even software limitations. And so we now have to fill out a document called the level of development, sometimes called level of detail, to help clarify just exactly what we are going to put in the model and what's going to be communicated in other forms. One thing is certain, there will always be a need for written specifications that are developed in parallel with the model. And so the project specifier has to be involved in decisions about information location as well as what's the content of that information 
so that we maintain the important principle that CSI identified many years ago of say it once, say it right, and in the right place. Lois, I think there's one other influence here, and I'll just throw sure. this out for discussion. Uh, some of this is going to depend upon your attitude as to where in the model the data is going to reside. I see that the current spec systems that are available for linking to BIM models uh, tend to focus on what Revit calls families uh, so that they're really the drawing objects where I see the biggest advantage for some of the BIM information is really in the scheduling such that perhaps we can attach most of the link to rooms uh, akin to room data sheets that we used to use when we did uh, yes. project programming instead of the yes, models, instead of the objects cuz filling out yeah filling out those schedules by hand is tedious uh, onerous and and uh, because of because it's a hand operation is often full of uh, mistakes and if we can get the machine to do those repetitive type tasks to uh, then filling out a room finish schedule for example uh, can be automated, fully automated. Yes, simply by dropping a room by name into a model. Exactly. And naming the spaces. And of course what do we use for naming spaces? Omniclass. Omniclass. Who developed Omniclass? CSI. Yeah. So it's time that we stopped producing specifications with word processing software and begin to really utilize database software so that we can produce reports of data for different purposes. A report is a way of structuring data to make it into information. Ideally, the owner's requirements would be communicated to the design team with uniformat organization so that which the design team would then flesh out to produce a preliminary project description for schematic design or in the IPD world criteria design and phase. Um, as a matter of fact uh, I produced a set of master specifications for uh, FedEx Corporation for lease build a suit type projects that were uh, uh, on airport sort facilities. Um, Tommy Smith, who was in attendance, uh, helped me with that project. We hired him as a consultant at my previous firm. And uh, that was an interesting exercise. We had to kind of reverse engineer. They had a full set of specs and drawings. And the, the organization that we used was Uniformat to, de to describe the systems and assemblies because uh, the client did not care really what the building looked like as long as it kept out the wind and the rain and met their uh, needs for the processes and the services that they were carrying on in that facility. And so Uniformat was an ideal way of doing that. As the design progresses through DD phase or detailed design in the IPD lingo, additional information and decisions are put into the database as individual components of the uniformat functional elements are defined. In other words, you can drill, use because uniformat is a an hierarchical and analytical classification system, you can drill down to the point where you get to the individual components of those uh, functional element descriptions, and at that point, they can interface, they can be assigned a master format number and uh, allow the information at some future point to be resorted. For example, the, what I've got here on the screen in this in terms of this diagram, we have concrete that's used for various functional purposes that would be described in a uniformat, but at some point we want to resort that information, that same data, for a different purpose, and that is to write construction specifications. And we want to write all of the concrete specs in a single section. And so it's really uniformat and master format are really two different ways of looking at the same information. And uh, my hope is that someday that uh, 
uh, in perhaps the next iteration format and unit format that instead of being separate books that are printed in paper, that they will in fact be a single unified database structure that we can access electronically and, and start to use uh, uh, to uh, actually store our data in. Then after we go through the master format organization for writing contract documents, during construction, the contractor would maintain that information with record data, again, contributing to that data stream, that data flow, by listing what actual products were used and any changes that were made during construction to uh, relate to uh, exterior, external conditions that might influence it. Finally, at the end of construction, the information could be resorted by unit format for facility management uses because it's because the um, sequence of information in unit format is a little more intuitive, well a lot more. It's a lot easier for people outside the AE industry to be able to find information and uh, so uh, for facilities management it is an ideal format for organizing that stuff. Well, that pretty much uh, is what I uh, brought. So uh, let's, talk, let's talk about this, this idea. Any contributions from the floor? How many so, did you make that day? <laughs> <laughs> Specifiers have true grit. I suppose. Well, we had a couple of questions, Lewis, and maybe uh, oh, let's just, Rob can let's help get us those. out with those. Sure. Sure, absolutely. Um, we had one that was in there for a while of, uh, from Seth Wiley, it looks like. Um, he was asking, can you comment on other integrated data environments, such as 1000D, windshield, and the like used by industry slash sectors? What have we learned and can yet learn from such endeavors? I'm not familiar with that one myself. Lewis, are you? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm and really not. Seth, if you have a microphone or if you've dialed in, perhaps you can uh, join us and explain what that is. And the only thing that I can imagine is perhaps it has something more to do with manufacturing than necessarily construction. But I'd like to know what it is. I don't know. Are there and others, Seth, Rob? Uh, yep, I've gone ahead and unmuted Seth as well to give him a moment to speak up here if he's, if he's available. Seth, are you there? All right. Apparently not. Okay. Now I'll, I'll move on to the next okay. question. That's from Mike McVitty. He was asking, uh, what would you think about placing all non-graphical information into BIM and having the specifications become an export from the model? I'm sorry, would you say that again? Sure, sure. I'll, go ahead. Oh, sure. Uh, what would you think about placing all non-graphical information into BIM and having the specifications become an export from the model? I love this. Well, there are some, right now, there are some, I think, some actual uh, technical limitations, uh, both uh, on the hardware side and the software side. Uh, people right now are we uh, had some problems with one of our offices that does a lot of healthcare work were importing uh, some furniture items that they had gotten BIM models from uh, vendors. And so you have like an examination table. Well, these tables were, uh, the model of that table was incredibly detailed. It had the interiors of the drawers. Uh, it had all kinds of pieces, and when you start stacking those things into a model, it gets so kludgy that it, it takes a long time to redraw things. Uh, it, was, it was a religious hospital, so there was a three-dimensional cross on the wall, and even little things like that start to take up time. So the more information we put into the model, it can slow the 
the behavior down, the uh, response time of the computer down. And this is a thing that we're struggling with here at our office is, you know, we can't afford to go out and buy everybody a super computer to run. Uh, we have to do that. I think that also that there are at present still some limitations even in the software on how much information can be attached. And that's why I understand that a lot of contractors, when they get BIM models from architects and engineers, one of the first things they do is actually go through and strip it down and <laughs> delete a lot of the information. Yeah, well, I think what Mike is trying to get to, though, Lewis, is he was talking about the non-graphic uh, data being inserted in the model. And I take that to mean some of the specification data and then the spec becomes a report out of the model. Uh, Mike, I would say that from what I see today that most of the architects and engineers are not ready to make that kind of a move, that what I see them using the models for is still graphics. Certainly the models are capable of doing what you're suggesting, but it also means that the designers are going to need to make specific selections and document their selections, and many of them are not willing to do that, that at least not the ones I'm working with. Uh, in some cases, I've become the bad guy where we're trying to work with designers to actually directly link the models to specifications where I'm asking them to put a marker board in the model so that the model actually generate the need to specify a marker board and the reaction is, you know that we need it, just specify it. We're not going to model it. Uh, so I think there's still that kind of an attitude from some of the designers. So I think getting to that end result is going to be really difficult. It's going to be a long term, long time coming. Well, there also the <coughs> the thing, the consideration that there are administrative requirements in our spec sections, such as uh, submittals, pre-installation uh, meetings, uh, field quality control testing and a lot of things that are not that need to be stated and that's going to vary from project to project and how that kind of information would be put into the model I think is somewhat problematical uh, to say nothing of the entire division one which uh, is stuff that costs money to build a building but doesn't result in permanent improvements to real property and then there also there's even the level of detail that is uh, drawn, uh, not every thing that is needed, for example, flashing, may not be modeled as such. You're going to export uh, from the model a uh, wall section and somebody's going to have to come back in and in, with 2D CAD at the present time draw in the flashing and some of those other little bits and pieces that are absolutely essential to the, the project but are not modeled in the strictest sense. Any others, Rob? Yep, we, we did get one other. Um, this seems to be a response or a, or a continuation of this discussion uh, from Justin Kerfoot. Uh, he says, I can see the idea of making decisions early for a design build project, but how would you do how would you do this with a traditional design bid build where in many cases the specific decisions can't be made in relation to products or how they might actually go together. Sometimes being too specific too early could be a cause of the need to redraw. Oh, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think I tried to stress and I hope I uh, communicated the need to make the decisions, the right decisions at the right time. And we don't want to uh, get too early. Uh, we, we don't want to get ahead of, of things. Things need to be done in sequence, uh, in a proper sequence. But on the other hand, the old style system allowed people to postpone and, and put off making decisions that they really should have made much earlier. Um, again, my experience in doing these quality assurance reviews, you, you get into CDs and it's obvious that the people who have some very special 
uh, curtain wall uh, details that they want to try to accomplish have never talked to the curtain wall people and have some unrealistic ideas about how they can be drawn. So uh, it, it's a matter of, of making the right decisions at the right time, but the whole point is to make them as early as possible, but not too early. I think one thing we can add here too, Lewis, is that if if we carefully make the decision about where the data goes, that then we can probably control the outcome a little bit better. If if for instance yes. a design decision is not made early and because models allow us to link both to unif well both three things. They, we can link to uniformat numbering, we can link to master format numbering, and we can link to omniclass numbering. So we can use any one of those three to link to an external document to be able to describe something that we're drawing very generically in a model because a decision hasn't been made. So it allows even to the capability of describing alternatives in the external document where we're, the model is only showing a single thing. And ultimately those alternatives either could be narrowed down in the external document and eventually put back into the model if necessary. Uh, and you, know, I, you and I have both worked on PPDs and I see that really as this sort of bridge document to go back and forth and allow some of the flexibility that I think is needed. And of course, one of the things that uh, uh, one of the big contributions that you made to the PPD format was the concept of we can start with a very uh, bare bones generic description of the individual functional elements, and then as time progresses and we make decisions, we can flesh out that information. It becomes more and more detailed and that could even replace the outline specifications and get us ready to, to do the, the uh, construction specifications. Uh, one of the things that in the, the old CSI manual practice about the uniformat use uh, organization for PPDs, preliminary project descriptions, was the assertion that you could describe the element in functional terms without making final design decisions. But as those decisions are made, they could be recorded in, uh, in uh, that data, amongst that data, as information. All right. Any others, Rob? Did we catch up? We, we caught up pretty good, but uh, Tommy Smith actually uh, submitted a question just now, actually. <laughs> How is the portion of work defined by a subcontract addressed in BIM? Over to you, Lewis. By the contractor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just because Tommy's my pal and partner in crime, uh, by the contractor. Uh, you know, fortunately, that's one of the things that passed out of the requirements to, on writing specs is having to figure out who does what. Um, and that is going to, uh, that may be an interesting challenge for contractors in the future to, to see. Uh, we're, we're going to see how that plays out. I think with, in the IPD world, because the major subcontractors get on board early in the project, um, that may actually facilitate some of that organizational, uh, some of those organizational de decisions. But even today, you know, we all write spec sections such as uh, joint sealers that four or five different subcontractors are going to have to uh, to do, and it may actually be easier once we get into the habit of describing our buildings as functional elements organized with uniformat to to. Uh, identify exactly what work goes into a work, given work package and maybe that might even uh, play out for describing what's in a, a given subcontract. Well David, why don't you tell us about some of your uh, 
behind scenes uh, smoking room smoking room uh, uh, talks that you had yeah with the uh, with the, the secret uh, cabal that runs all of this stuff. Well, I'm not sure it's all that secretive, but anyhow, <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of uh, being invited to attend two separate meetings at Construct, one with um, Walt Marlowe and discussing the Master Specifiers Retreat, a new concept that CSI is trying. Uh, the first event will be held in March. Uh, 2012. I think it's the week, second weekend in March, and Walt. I know Walt's on, and I'm sure he'll give us the dates because I can't remember them. Uh, but the concept is, if anybody's familiar with ARC uh, US, uh, is to get specifiers rather than architects, specifiers, and put them together with manufacturers uh, at a high level. We're looking for um, the top-notch specifiers and the manufacturers to be able to get them together to talk about things that the specifiers are looking for, perhaps some ideas to share with the manufacturers as to where they may take their products or how they may uh, change the current products that they have, and some of the information that they're providing to specifiers. It's also an educational opportunity uh, for everyone involved. I know that Walt has some pretty good uh, speakers, I believe, lined up already. And Walt, I know you're on the line. I don't know if you're muted, but maybe you want to jump in here and say. Yeah, Rob, why don't you unmute Walt and let's say, let's uh, hear a little more about yeah, this. Yeah, anybody that may be interested, you need to register on the CSI website and at csinet.org and then it's slash MSR, Master Specifiers Retreat. And that'll take you to the registration form, relatively short form to fill out, but you do need to register. Walter, are you there with us? Yeah, David, can you hear me? Absolutely, go ahead. Hey, uh, yeah, we're we're real excited about getting this program off the ground. You know, it's another attempt, I think, for CSI to be pursuing its mission and trying to bring value to our members you know, in another tangible way, uh, we need a lot of channels to try to get this information out to folks. And, you know, one of our challenges at CSI is, you know, the value we bring to the marketplace in a lot of ways is, is we bring together the various players on the construction team together in a way that a lot of other organizations that are focused on one profession uh, really don't do a good job at. So. Uh, because we have so many diverse uh, people in the CSI community, we're going to need to probably have a little more diverse channels to get information out to them. So this master specifier event is, is really aimed to take advantage of, you know, we have some very senior, very experienced, some very, very smart specifiers as part of the CSI community. Their role may be changing as we go forward into this digital, hyper-connected uh, world. Uh, but what are we doing for those people? You know, we have the convention, which probably has a very wide range of uh, education opportunities. Uh, we have the academies now, which we brought back, that are probably aimed at you know people with experience, but more that mid-level experience. Uh, so let's do an event that really reaches our senior, very experienced people that's focused on advanced information and very much focused on knowledge sharing amongst the participants. Uh, so I'm, I'm real excited that we're getting this off the ground. As you mentioned, uh, you know, ARC US is kind of like this, but they're focused at more of a broader architectural audience. Uh, we're very, very laser focused on the senior specifier at this event. And uh, as you mentioned, we're looking to get some good exchanges between the senior specifiers and uh, senior people from building product manufacturers, not so much that it's just they come meet the manufacturer and learn about their product, but that we get a real exchange about what are some of the challenges each group is facing and how can we address them collaboratively. So I'm real excited about it. Uh, uh, of course, the you know we can't accommodate everybody. Uh, we do have an open application process. 
so far, uh, we have not had enough applications to fill the seats, so I certainly encourage everyone uh, to read about the event uh, and consider applying if their timing works for them and they think the uh, event will work for them. Uh, we do, we're still trying to scope out some of the details of the program. Uh, I am hoping that we get some information up on the website that gives a little more information into the program other than just the generic kind of schedule that's up there right now. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. Uh, we're looking forward to moving forward with this and uh, making it a valuable part of uh, the CSI offering. Walt, I want to say that I'm, uh, you know, one of the most valuable things about CSI to me has always been, I've been a member since 1982, <coughs> has been that uh, the spirit of sharing information uh, between members and, and whether it's a knowing the right product rep to call uh, and who then knows how, how to talk my lingo to give me the information I need rather than uh, you know some canned speech or knowing fellow specifiers that I can turn to to help me solve some naughty problem um, and I'm just really thrilled with this whole concept of the practice groups that uh, the uh, opportunity to uh, share ideas and and ask questions uh, in these affinity groups has been um, I've, very rewarding for me as a participant and I hope it's uh, rewarding to our attendees but I, I think CSI is really on the right track with these practice groups to allow people from across the country to make connect new connections and uh, share ideas and and share knowledge. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Lois, and want to thank you, Walt, for joining us today and keeping me straight on my report of that meeting, <laughs> 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 setting the record straight after I fouled it all up, I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, the other meeting that I attended was with Paul Bertram, the CSI uh, Institute president, and Paul called the meeting really to address BIM and specifications, and I was absolutely thrilled to be in the same room with the caliber of people that Paul invited to the meeting. There were about a dozen of us, and again, all high-level uh, players in, in the CSI community. And the sense that I get from Paul is that he's trying to put CSI into a position where we can actually be leading the charge in taking control of some of the of the information that gets uh, associated with BIM models. And we're trying to work with the current program that's already in place, the Specifier Property Information Exchange uh, that's being run through NIBS. Uh, Mark Kalin has been instrumental in trying to help uh, get that started, and the CSI Technical Committee at the moment is reviewing uh, some, the first set of sample templates that'll be released under the program and hopefully... Uh, David, uh, wouldn't, would you take just a minute and explain for our uh, 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 listeners uh, what that SPIE stuff is? Um, it's an exciting idea to me, but I, I'm not sure everybody has heard about it. So take a few minutes and talk about that a little bit. Okay, I will try to do that. What, what's happened is in the first pass we've taken uh, specification sections and essentially tried to identify the attributes that would be associated with a spec that should be also included in a BIM model and hopefully provided and pop the, the database for these things to be populated by the manufacturers based upon what specifiers believe they need. Uh, for instance, we'll take just take a uh, flush wood door. So the kinds of things a specifier would be interested in might be the facing. Is it a veneer? Is it an MDO sheet? What kind of core does it have? What's the thickness? What size is it? A fire rating, smoke rating, and the finish. list goes on, finish. The list goes on and on and on. So we're trying to, with the current 
set of specifications, whether it's through master spec or BSC spec link or any of the others, and our own personal experience trying to identify all these properties that are important to each of these materials. So, so, so try to help standardize uh, the information that would be needed to get the right product. Correct. And then and, hopefully... And then if on a, on a different kind of product, for example, uh, aluminum uh, curtain wall, you'd have a different set of attributes, obviously, rather than the same ones. And But again, to try to standardize that and, and help people decide on what's important for their given project. Right. And, and at this point, it's really a first pass. I said we have 50-some templates that we're trying to review in, <coughs> in time to return comments to NIBS uh, so that they can release the first information really about the program at EcoBuild in December uh, in Washington, D.C. I know Mark Kalin will be serving, I think, as a panelist on the uh, session that will be presenting this information. So it's, it's exciting that we have an opportunity in, to be able to contribute to the program. And actually, I, I believe the technical committee through Greg Seaton at the Institute staff is looking for volunteers also to contribute uh, their thoughts on these templates. So if you're willing to help, you certainly don't have to review all of them. Uh, and right now it's split about 50-50 between uh, what I classify as architectural subjects and engineering subjects. So if there are engineers out there, we could really use your help uh, to review most of the engineering sections. And architectural, certainly anybody that's willing to contribute. Uh, Rob, I may put you on the spot here and uh, suggest that folks interested could contact you or, or me, and we'll certainly get you connected with the technical committee, and, and hopefully we can get you signed up to review some of these documents. So I think that um, it could be an exciting opportunity for CSI to begin leading this, and with CSI's acquisition of SpecLink, SpecLink already has a connection through SpecLink, no, through Linkman E to go from a Revit model to specifications and be able to connect those two and be able to perform some level of initial editing in the specifications by what is actually modeled in the Revit uh, software. So being able then to then link SPY and, and Revit through Linkman E could be a tremendous advantage. Exciting times. Hey, David, uh, we're right at the hour. Uh, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about what we have in, in mind for next, next month. Uh, we're, this month we're way out in the future, at a, kind of a strategic level, and next month we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty. Yes, we, Lewis and I have had a number of people actually contact us asking for uh, suggestions as to how to deal with the nitty-gritty of doing some word processing and some of the things that can actually make uh, word processing specifications in particular more efficient. And we've got a couple of uh, things that we can share with you, and we're going to do some demonstrations, and I'll show you some of the intermediate and advanced features that we're actually using in our firm and hopefully we'll be able to share some tidbits that you can take back and put to use immediately to improve your own practice. So that's scheduled okay. for first Thursday in November, which is the third, and it will be at the same time, 4 o'clock Eastern, and those of you in other time zones, you have to do the calculation yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope that you can all come, and, and we're looking for some uh, lively discussions. So if you do have some specific questions about uh, automating some word processing things, why please send them in to David or, or me or to Rob. And so we can, um, we want to meet your needs. And if there's uh, some specific headaches that you're having, um, maybe one of us can help you figure out 
uh, a quick and easy solution. So uh, let us hear from you. Send in those cards. Keep those cards and letters coming in, neighbors. All right, and if Lewis and I can't figure it out for you, there's probably somebody else on the call that has experienced it and has figured it out. So we'll hopefully share with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks very much, then, everyone, for joining us today. It's been a great discussion. I appreciate all of the comments that we receive from you and look forward to having you join us again next month. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>